morning, everyone. Oh, we could do better. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today, and uh, welcome to those of you online with us. Uh, we appreciate you being with us as well, and uh, I've got just a few announcements to start uh, our time together this morning. The first one of those uh, I like to remind you of each week, and that's the Connect card. It's that blue and white card in your pew, and uh, the purpose of that is uh, for us to uh, be able to connect with you, with, whether that's through prayer requests, uh, prayer needs, or praises that you have, or if you have questions, uh, you can fill that out, put any of that information in there. We'd love to hear from you in that way as well, um, so take advantage of that. If you're online with us, there's a digital connect card, so you can click the link in the video description, and it'll take you to a mobile version of that, so you can do that as well. Um, I've had a couple of questions the last two weeks, uh, people wondering how they can uh, worship with us through giving, and so I'll just uh, remind people the ways we have available for you to do that. Uh, one is in person, as you leave today, there will be ushers at the doors with offering plates, uh, you could do it that way. Uh, there's also an online giving option, if you ever need help with that, if you're interested in utilizing that but don't really know how that works, let us know as staff and uh, We've helped multiple people with that before. We'd love to help you the same. If you're with us in video, you can see a link to that in the description. And then we have some people who just mail that. So uh, I just like to keep you informed as to what is available in that way. Um, if you're visiting with us today, whether you're online or you're here with us in person, know that that is the part of today that uh, is not for you, okay? We're, it's not an expectation, something we uh, want to put out there and say you should join us in that manner. Um, so we, we want to just welcome you here and pray that the Lord would encourage you today. Um, we've got some new adult classes that are starting, some that uh, have started already, some that are going to be starting in October. So uh, if you uh, aren't aware of what those are, I would encourage you to stop by Center Point, out these doors, and uh, take a look around. There's two classes that are going to be starting in October um, those are actually, there's sign-ups for those over on the table, um, just out these doors. One of those, I'm going to be teaching a five-week course through uh, a kind of a care ministry training. We're going to be talking about uh, what is the biblical call for us to care for one another, to bear one another's burdens, uh, what does that look like, and then some practical strategies for how to do that. And the reason I'm teaching this course is uh, I've realized in uh, my uh, a little over eight years of ministry experience, I've had a lot of training and equipping with how to care for people in a variety of settings, and I want to train you all with that same, uh, that same information. Um, the second class is uh, actually a marriage class uh, called Vertical Marriage, and uh, that's going to be taught by Charlie and Rhonda Bird. so uh, if you have not taken that, I would encourage you to. It is a great encouragement and challenge, no matter what phase of your marriage relationship you are at, okay? So uh, take a look at those. If you have questions, let us know. Um, while you're out there, take a look at some of the other stuff that's at Center Point. There's uh, all that stuff is there for you to take and uh, information for you to have. So uh, take a look at that. If you're online with us and you'd like information about any of these things, uh, simply call or email us this week and we would love uh, to talk with you further about that. Right, so I'm going to have you uh, stand with me, church. We're gonna uh, we're gonna pray, and then uh, we we are going to um, we're gonna sing one song before we jump into our prayer time. And I want you to be thinking about if you have any specific prayer requests or praises that you would like to share just with the church body. Um, if you're online with us, you will we'll ask you to type those in the comments section for people who are there to see as well. And uh, then we're going to spend some time praying for each other uh, after the song, all right? Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you're a God who is sovereign and holy. Uh, Lord, you are righteous and good. Lord, you're worthy of our praise. And today uh, we ask that you would open our eyes to see um, what you have called us to as your people. That we would have opportunity to encourage one another as we uh, strive to pursue a Jesus and become more like him. I pray that you would uh, uh, root us further into your word and uh, as a church that we would uh, build everything we're doing on the, the firm foundation of uh, Christ as the only way to salvation. 
God, that you would uh, motivate us now as we consider uh, the gospel, the good news, that we have been given an eternal hope that we do not deserve. Lord, we pray all of these things through our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Galatians 6 2 uh, reminds us, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And uh, this is the focal point church when we think about our call to pray for one another and uh, to, to celebrate uh, praises with our church family as well as pray for those things that are just challenging and hard. And a couple of uh, specific requests that uh, I was asked to share this morning with you, and then I just want to open it up and allow you to share um, anything that uh, you're coming with that you'd like prayer for or would like to declare praise for. Um, one is, uh, some of you may have gotten the email about uh, Jim Trone this last week. Friday, he was taken by ambulance to OSF, was struggling to breathe and couldn't, couldn't talk, and um, they, uh, they found some inflammation in his uh, throat. And uh, they were initially concerned that it is, was a mass of some kind. Um, the the uh, more they did research, the more they think it's possibly some inflammation due to some medication reaction, uh, which is a good thing if that is the case. So uh, I got word this morning that they were going to work at trying to get the breathing tube. He was intubated so he could breathe, but they're going to try to get that tube out and see how he does today. So uh, continue pray for Jim and Elsie. And uh, pray that uh, not only for healing, but for uh, just stamina as they navigate this. That's uh, just a really hard, uh, hard thing to endure. So uh, pray for them and their family. 
And then uh, this morning I got a text from uh, Sandy Wittig, and uh, uh, she tested positive for COVID and asked the church to just pray for her. Uh, she's doing okay right now, but pray for healing for her and uh, pray for protection over her husband Steve as well and uh, that they'd navigate that okay, all right? So those are two that I was asked to share, and uh, I want to open it up. Is there any other prayer requests that you have or praises that you want to share? And those online, uh, just type those in the comments uh, so people online can uh, pray for those things as well. So prayers or praises that you want to share this morning? So, Teresa's niece's husband, Dusty, uh, is 38, and he has really bad cancer. They've had to do a number of operations and remove a lot, and uh, so pray for them, and uh, yeah. Other prayer requests? So that's your great nephew, you said. So pray for Dale's great nephew who was in a bad accident. He was on a tractor and hit by a semi. And uh, he needs just prayer for continued healing as they've done operations and just pray for strength for him. Okay, thanks for sharing. Other prayers or praises? Did you say mother-in-law or daughter-in-law? Mother-in-law. Okay. Garrick's mom. mom. Okay. Okay. Fell and broke her leg. And they said the scan showed nine breaks. Okay. So uh, what's her first name? Monica. Monica. Pray for Monica. All right. Thank you for sharing. Great. So Colin shared the uh, VVMI partner, uh, Vina, uh, aired eight episodes for three different unreached people groups in Siberia. Is that what you said? In southern Siberia. The production. Okay. And uh, that the Lord just seems to keep moving that forward really rapidly. So praise the Lord for that. Thanks for sharing that. Amen. Anything else, church? Prayers or praises we can share in? Pray for your grandma, okay, Grandma Sean, okay, we'll pray for Sean, pray that she gets to feeling better, thanks for sharing that.
So just a prayer, yeah, praise for the, what the Lord's doing through CBS. Absolutely, amen to that. And I'm excited about uh, how the Lord's going to use that community Bible study. And uh, if you want more information on that, let me know. We'd love to get you plugged in what that looks like. So, Okay, anything else as we uh, prepare to go to the Lord in prayer this morning, church? This is great. said your sister's name's Angie, okay, and then what's your nephew's first name? Tyson? Okay. So uh, Danny's sister's recovering from COVID, uh, sister Angie, so pray for Angie, and then nephew Tyson broke his wrist, is that right? Okay, pray for healing there. All right, church, so here's what we're going to do, okay? Uh, we're just going to go to the Lord in prayer, and um, if there's anything else that wasn't mentioned that you want prayed for, I want to encourage you to pray for that out loud, and then any of these things that were shared, just uh, take some time, pray for that. If you, if you want to pray out loud for any of these things, do that, and then after a little bit, I'm going to close us in prayer, and we're going to move into the rest of our time together, okay? Um, those of you online, we want to ask you to just take this time and uh, pray for these things you've heard and anything that others have mentioned in the comments. And um, uh, then we'll close in prayer and move on into the rest of our time together. All right, let's pray.
Father, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us in Christ to come before you with these requests, knowing that you hear our prayers, Lord. Also recognizing that we are weak people in desperate need of your help. Lord, whether it's sickness or uh, injury, God, or seemingly mountainous struggle to get the Bible to other languages. Lord, you are bigger, you are stronger, you are greater. Father, give us a, a, a mindset, an attitude of dependence upon you. And I pray that same thing for those listed here. Lord, thinking of, uh, thinking of Monica and trying to heal and recover from a broken leg and the pain and the immobility of that. Father, I pray that you would uh, not only bring physical healing, but even more than that, Lord, bring a sense of peace and comfort that could only come from you. That, uh, Lord, you would... Uh, intersect her life with the truth of the gospel that she would be reminded, um, Lord, and hear the truth that, uh, Lord, you have given your son on her behalf. God, I pray for, uh, I pray for Angie and Tyson who are, are both in healing and recovery and, um, Lord, pray that you would Surround them with people who would ultimately be a source of comfort and hope and message of truth uh, to them. Uh, Lord, to uh, again intersect in their life right now with the truth of who you are. And uh, Lord, what you have uh, brought about through Christ. Pray for Jim and Elsie this morning. And pray for her strength, specifically for Elsie as she tries to care for and uh, intercede on behalf of Jim at this time. Pray that you'd bring Jim out of this in a quick manner, that it wouldn't be uh, as bad as they initially thought, and that he would provide healing to his body and strength, Lord, uh, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, that you would use this season to uh, develop in them a perseverance and, Lord, even just a further testimony of your goodness uh, through hardship. Father, I pray for, uh, for Dusty and for his wife, and Lord, you know the depths of this situation. We pray that you would be very present in a, in a season of life that seems so hopeless, and we know, God, that uh, nothing is impossible with you, so we trust you with this, and leave that into your hands. And Lord, for Steve and Sandy, we pray that uh, you would continue to uh, protect them, that you would bring healing to Sandy, and uh, Lord, that she would get through this without any major complications or troubles, that uh, you would continue to uh, reveal to them, even in this uh, difficult time, Lord, your presence, your promises, your truth, your word. Um, Lord, that you would be glorified even in hardship. Father, today, may these reminders uh, motivate and propel us uh, further into worship together, not only in song, um, but in fellowship, in time in your word, Lord, all of this for your glory, for your purposes, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, church.
given us the ability to gather and sit under uh, your teaching, Lord. I pray that you would open our eyes to see uh, how this intersects with where each one here, each one listening is at today, that you would equip us, Lord, to step into a community and a world that so desperately needs the gospel with not only motivation, but with passion, with boldness to declare your truth for your glory above all else. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go and have a seat. Take your Bibles and open up to Joshua chapter 8. Joshua chapter 8. And if you don't have a Bible, I'd encourage you to grab one of the Pew Bibles in front of you, and it's around page 216 in your Pew Bibles. Uh, I just want to make sure everyone's got a copy of God's Word, everyone's uh, taking a hard look at Scripture, and if you're online with us, we want you to do the same. Uh, No excuses there, get a Bible, even if it's an electronic copy, if you pull your Bible up on your phone, whatever you need to do, we want you to have your eyes on God's Word today as we continue through our study in Joshua. Um, But before we move any further into our study on Joshua, I want you to just pause for a moment. And uh, I want you to consider a time in your life uh, when you were the most fearful that you have been. I want you to think about what caused that. What caused that fearful state I want you to think about how you felt in that moment. I want you to think about how you responded to that feeling of fear. And in the end, I want you to think about what brought you out of that fearful state. Now, for most of us, I would venture to say that it's not that hard for us to go back and think about a time when we were maybe even crippled by fear. Some of you may be saying today, well, it's not in the past, it's right now. It's present day that I just feel completely overwhelmed and crippled by fear of something, whatever that might be. But what is really interesting as we think about this is how often... We move from one place of fear or anxiety to another uh, without ever really stopping to look at why am I repeating this cycle. And I'm with you in this, okay, church family? I'm, I'm in the same boat with you in this, in that 
It is so easy to be in a season of fear and anxiety, and when it's through, you maybe pray to the Lord and say, Lord, thank you for sustaining me. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your grace, even in this hard struggle season. But then, we kind of move forward, and it's not long before all of a sudden there's another season like that, and we repeat this cycle over and over and over again. Now, the reason I ask you this question, I want you to hang on to that until the end of our time today, because it's crucial to put ourselves in this framework as even we understand and immerse ourselves into the narrative of Joshua coming off of Joshua chapter 7 last week and into chapter 8. We pick up our story really in kind of a troubling time. God had worked in some amazing ways But now, Israel had just been reminded of the severity of sin and its destructive impact. Not only on the individual person, but on the community as a whole. Now, if you missed last week's message, I want to encourage you this week to go back and listen to that. Because the focus of Joshua chapter 7 is really on the destructive nature of sin. And we saw this character, Achan, this man who was a part of the nation of Israel. He was a part of God's chosen people who strayed away from that which God had specifically said they were not to do. And so as a result, Israel went up into battle against Ai and were defeated. Because there was undealt with sin in their midst. Now, if you stop and consider that and put yourselves in the shoes of anyone in the Israelite nation, and even further to put yourself in the shoes of Joshua, it's understandable to pause a minute and go, ooh, I'd be a little apprehensive too. To now come off of that, 36 men killed in battle, Achan and all his family are killed, and a pile of stones is heaped up to remember this place of trouble. It would make you a little gun shy. In all of this, I want us to understand something. I want us to understand that fear, everyone say fear. Fear is a healthy emotion, but cannot remain the driving emotion in our lives. Fear is healthy in the sense that even godly fear is something that's to be part of who we are in recognition of who God is. But earthly, man-made fear, when allowed to drive us, what we will see even in this text is by the reminders will drive us further and further away from what God has desired for us and even more so will take our eyes off of the infinite God we serve and focus on the issues that we so desperately just want to deal with ourselves. So, with these things in mind, We're going to pick up in verse 1 and see how this story continues to unfold. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, and his people, his city, and his land, and you shall do to I and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves. Lay an ambush against the city behind it. Verse 3. So Joshua and all the fighting men arose to go up to Ai, and Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them out by night. And he commanded them, Behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city behind it. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you remain ready. And I and all the people who are with me will approach the city, and when they come out against us, just as before, we shall flee before them. 
And they will come out after us until we have drawn them away from the city. For they will say, they are fleeing from, bef- from us just as before. So we will flee before them. Then you shall rise up from the ambush, seize the city, for the Lord your God will give it into your hand. And as soon as you have taken the city, you shall set the city on fire. Now, if you are someone who marks in your Bibles, I want you to box or underline this next phrase. It's crucial to our understanding of God's will here. Joshua says, you shall do according to the word of the Lord. See, I have commanded you. Verse 9. So Joshua sent them out, and they went to the place of ambush and lay between Bethel and Ai, to the west of Ai. But Joshua spent that night among the people. Joshua rose early in the morning and mustered the people and went up, he and the elders of Israel, before the people of Ai. And all the fighting men who were with him went up and drew near before the city and encamped on the north side of Ai, with a ravine between them and Ai. He took about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. So they stationed the forces, the main encampment that was north of the city and its rear guard, west of the city. But Joshua spent that night in the valley. And as soon as the king of Ai saw this, he and all his people, the men of the city, hurried and went out early to the appointed place towards Arabah to meet Israel in battle. But he did not know that there was an ambush against him behind the city. Verse 15. And Joshua and all Israel pretended to be beaten before them and fled in the direction of the wilderness. So all the people who were in the city were called together to pursue them. And as they pursued Joshua, they were drawn away from the city. Not a man was left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel. They left the city open and pursued Israel. So you can start to see where this is going. Verse 18. Then the Lord said to Joshua, stretch out the javelin that's in your hand towards I, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the javelin that was in his hand toward the city, and the men in the ambush rose quickly out of their place, and as soon as he had stretched out his hand, they ran and entered the city and captured it, and they hurried to set the city on fire. So when the men of Ai looked back, behold, the smoke of the city went up to heaven, and they had no power to flee this way or that, for the people who fled to the wilderness turned back against the pursuers. And when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had captured the city, and that the smoke of the city went up, then they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. And the others came out from the city against them, so they were in the midst of Israel, some on this side, some on that side, and Israel struck them down until there was left none that survived or escaped. But the king of Ai they took alive and brought him near to Joshua. Note here, church, that there's a few differences in how chapter 8 unfolds from what chapter 7 What happened in chapter 7? First off, the Lord begins this conversation with Joshua by saying, do not fear or be dismayed. Now this is why it becomes really evident that clearly there was at least a small notion of fear or apprehension in Joshua that the Lord would be faithful to remind him, Joshua, don't be afraid or dismayed. Well, why would he be afraid or dismayed? Well, he just watched the nation of Israel completely defeated because of the sin of one man. And now the same nation that they were to go up against before and were defeated by, he's about ready to have to go back again. Put ourselves in any place like that and you and I are going to be a little bit afraid and a little bit apprehensive. But God reminds Joshua, do not fear or be dismayed. Why? Ultimately, it's God's way of saying, don't be afraid because I am bigger and I have given this nation into your hands. So don't worry about it. Now, the second difference here is we will notice that in the second part of verse 1, God says, take all, everyone say all, 
take all the fighting men with you. How is this different? Well, if we go back to chapter 7, we remember the spies went up to see, what is this place, this next kingdom, this next nation we're going to, kind of get a gauge to see how much force is going to be needed, and they come back really confident. We don't need that many people. It's a small nation. And you've got to remember, they're thinking Jericho was huge. Now they step into I and, what? hey, you don't need to send a bunch of guys. We... So they sent 3,000 men. And they were driven out. God had different plans. This time God says, you send all of your military men. A third way this is different is in God's liberty he gives to the people when he says, you can plunder whatever is left. Specifically in verse 2, you shall do to I and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, only its spoil and its livestock you shall take for yourselves, lay an ambush against the city behind it. So there's some differences here, but there's one consistent factor that I really want us to recognize one application truth I want you to grab hold of in this and this is something we see throughout the whole narrative of Joshua and ultimately church I want you to realize this is something we see through the whole narrative of scripture and that is simply that all power and planning is from God all power and planning when it comes to the overtaking and fulfillment of God's promises, all of that comes from God himself. Now this truth is even further emphasized in the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. And he reminds them of this. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to whom? God. Everyone say God. The surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Now specifically, Paul is saying there, hey, the power is not in myself. It would be like the same as me reminding you, church, and I hope you hold this true, the power to lead and step into what God has called us to does not lie in me, but in the one who has called me. That is all power and plan must be from God. With God's power, the mighty walls of Jericho fall. Yet without God, the smallest of battles cannot be won. Just as we saw in chapter 7, right? With God on your side, fulfilling the word of the Lord. And this is where Joshua's words in verse 8 are so crucial, church. You shall do according to the word of Yahweh. You shall do according to the word of the Lord. Not the word of man. Not the opinion of man. Not the word of culture. Not the opinion of the world. The word of God. Now, our problem is that we often take one of three approaches when we encounter these vast battles that we face and the struggles that... And here's here's the, the three approaches that I'm convinced we most often take. The first approach that we are prone to take is that we leave everything in God's hands and we never take action ourselves. We go, I check the box for salvation. I'm saved, I'm redeemed, and now I'm just going to sit back and let God do his thing. I'm I'm just going to let him take control. He's he's in control anyway. You know what, I'm just going to be passive. I'm going to sit on my hands. I'll I'll go through the motions I need to, but that's it. That's it. Everyone say, wrong. Wrong. Oh, we do better than that. Everyone say, wrong. Okay, there we go, that's better. Okay? That's the first approach some of us will take, whether we realize it or not. The second approach, I'm convinced we often take in this, is that we can't stop looking at how big the mountain is and how small I am. 
we become fixated on the mountain. And so then as a result of becoming fixated on the mountain and going, there's no way I can do this. I, I can't do this. Then we lose faith in God and we lose faith that he's going to do anything about it. We take our eyes off of him and we just stop trying. It's too big. It's too big for me to encounter. You're right, but we're going to come to that in a minute. The third approach that I'm convinced we also, we often take is that, and the, number three is what I am most guilty of, church. We convince ourselves that this is a me-sized problem, and I'm not going to bother God with it. I got this, God. It's all under control. Even when everything's in chaos. I'm spinning all these plates. If I could actually spin plates, I would have done that illustration this morning. Which maybe it would have been a better illustration because all of them would have fallen on the ground. And it would have been evidence like, yeah, you can't do that. You're exactly right. But we like to think we can, don't we? We like to convince ourselves that, oh, God, you got bigger problems to deal with. And I'll, I'll take this one off your hands. And yet the gospel application of this church, when we think New Testament... We think God reminding his people, you don't need to be afraid. Why? Because I'm bigger. You need to do according to the word of the Lord. Why? Because he is bigger. You need to follow the plan according to what God has ordained the plan to be. Why? Because he's in control. How do we bring this into full swing when we think about our relationship with Christ? And it's this. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. John 15. You have to abide in the true vine because apart from that, you can do nothing. Now, that does not mean that you don't have skills and abilities and talents that you can go into the world and you could accomplish some earthly things. In eternity's eyes, you can do nothing of your own power or strength. It has to be through And so when we think about lasting impact, we think about the things that are going to matter when it comes to eternity, when we think about the things that God has called us to, we are incapable, church, of doing any of that apart from Christ. And you and I are so prone to become fixated on the mountains ahead of us that we lose sight of the God we serve. I'll give you a couple practical examples, just real life, real time, of where this can become dangerous. You step out of these walls and you look at culture, you watch the news, you're on social media, you look at all these things and you go, oh, this is so overwhelming. This mountain is so big and it seems like it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. If you're seeking to live a biblical worldview and you're seeking to understand and live out what God and Christ has called you to, then when you step out here, man, it is tense. It is hard. It is not easy. And we can easily become so focused on that that we just stop trying. We stop being bold. We stop proclaiming the gospel because someone gets upset about it. We stop actually trying to model and share Jesus or more commonly, we stop actually believing this to be true. And we decide we're going to pick and choose what we want. Why? Because, because Pastor Matt, the mountain's so big, there's no way. There, there's no way we're going to encounter this. You're right, we will not, but God will. He's already promised he will. That's the hope that is yet to come. And we're called on mission to do these things, to live this way, to act this way, to pursue Jesus. Not because of what we are able to accomplish, but because of what God in Christ already has. Another practical mountain that just even locally, right here at Efri, that we can so easily become focused on. And this isn't just at Efri, it's any local church body. We can be some, become so concerned by financial numbers or a mountain of the mortgage and all of these things we fixate on. And church, I'm telling you the same thing that I said when I candidated here to be your shepherd three years ago, that I'm convinced if we keep our eyes fixated on what God has called us to do and to be as his church, the Lord will provide. 
But the minute we take our eyes off of that and start focusing on the mountain instead of the God who is bigger than that is the minute we will begin to die. We have got to remain focused on the God who has given us salvation, the God of creation, the God of the Bible, and recognize that all power and all plan for the future rests in Him. Amen? In the next portion of this in Joshua chapter 8, we see kind of a difficult section of scripture. Verse 24, when Israel had finished killing all the inhabitants of Ai in the open wilderness where they pursued them and all of them to the very last had fallen by the edge of the sword, all Israel returned to Ai and struck it down with the edge of the sword. And all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai. But Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out the javelin until he had devoted all the inhabitants of Ai to destruction. We come to a passage of scripture like this, it should cause us to pause. And ultimately, what it should do is it should cause us to remember and recognize the destructiveness of sin. And it's really easy for us to get caught up in this discussion about was this justified? Is God wrong for taking matters into his hands this way? And the answer simply, church, is no. Um, when asked why, why, why is this okay? It's because God sees the depths of humanity's hearts and as the author of creation, he is the only one who is capable of bringing about true justice. And that's really hard for us to wrestle with because we look at something and we'll go, well, that's not how I would do it. And if resting in our own strength and ability, chances are there's a lot of people in this room that you probably wouldn't have died for either. And yet God has a plan in this. But something interesting happens in verse 29. It says, And he hanged the king of Ai on a tree until evening. And at sunset Joshua commanded, and they took his body down from the tree and threw it at the entrance of the gate of the city and raised over it a great heap of stones which stands there to this day. Why? Because God desired that the people remember the destructiveness of sin. Here was a nation of people who had chosen to live contrary to the word of the Lord and taint his majesty and his glory and his name. And that meant to serve as a reminder. But here's another truth that we can recognize from this narrative is we think about the application of this to the gospel. The king of Ai was slaughtered for his sin, according to the word of the Lord. Christ was slaughtered for ours. Not because he had sinned, because scripture says he was without sin, but because we had sinned, and we deserve the same penalty as the king of Ai. We don't often stop and think about that, do we? To put ourselves in the shoes of the ones who experienced the just hand of God's vengeance for the sake of his holiness. To stop and consider that Christ was slaughtered for our sin. It should cause us pause in the midst of this narrative. Now, in verses 30 through 35, something really profound happens. It says, At that time Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel. As it is written on the book, in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones, upon which no man has wielded an iron tool, and they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And there, in the presence of the people of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. And all Israel, everyone say all. All Israel, sojourner as well as native born, with their elders and officers and their judges, stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord. 
half of them in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded at the first to bless the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all, everyone say all, he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. Church, here's the simple truth that we see applied in Joshua chapter 8. All the law for all the people. There was not one of them that was exempt from hearing the truth of the law read to them. Reminded not only of the blessings of the Lord, but also the curses of the Lord, the challenges, the hard parts of the law. This is why we have got to be faithful church. Not to just take the word of God, the words of God that we like or that we enjoy or that promise us things that we want but we actually have to look at the whole counsel of scripture and read all of this with not only for ourselves but as a church and in our homes with our children they have to understand the depth of all that God has commanded and there is no one person exempt from that The word all in this section is actually used five different times between verses 33 and 35. And another place we see that mentioned so profoundly is 2 Timothy 3.16, which says, all scripture is breathed out by God. And it's not only breathed out by God, it's profitable for teaching, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All of it. Even the hard sections. And all of this, where do we bring this full circle? This is where I want you to go back to the beginning of our message today and pull out what that was that caused you such fear and anxiety, whether that's past or present day, church. And I want you to remember this. If we lose sight of God's word, we allow fear to drive us. Why? Because... When we lose sight of God's word, the only thing we have to rest on is our own. Which means as I navigate every season of unknowns that's going to come from this day forward, if I do not have my eyes fixed on the author of all of these things, then the thing I'm going to resort to to drive every action I take, every word I speak, is fear. And you can fill in the blank with fear of, fear of loss, fear of hardship, fear of challenge, fear of struggle, fear of pain. If I take my eyes off of God's word, if I lose sight of this, then when I encounter those mountains that are yet to come and church goodness recognize they will come then I will resort to fear and anxiety in and of myself instead of embracing a peace that can only come from God. Why? Because he's the only one bigger than every mountain I'm going to face in this life. What or who has the greatest influencing voice in your life today, church? If we keep waiting for the world to speak comfort or peace to us, you're going to be waiting until the day you die. In thinking about this, what should this drive me to do? Practically, what should this drive me to do? I'm going to give you several things this morning, practically, that you can do today. Think about what you consume most. What we consume will inevitably inevitably become who we are, church. Think about that for a moment. What we consume will inevitably become who we are. For many of us, we spend countless hours immersing ourselves in pointless media, and then we act frustrated when we can't seem to make time for God's word. It's a hard truth. Think about what consumes you most. Next, spend more time 
seeking God's agenda than trying to defend your own. Spend more time seeking to understand God's purpose and agenda than trying to defend your own. That means taking intentional time to pray and seek the Lord. It means setting aside time to open your Bible and seek to understand, Lord, what are you trying to do and what do you desire of me in this season? And spend more time doing that than you do trying to defend whatever personal agenda you have on the docket today. And goodness, those can be big or small, church. But we get really fired up and passionate about those personal agendas. I want to challenge you to spend more time seeking to understand God's agenda than trying to defend your own. And lastly, remind yourself daily of the gospel and how undeserving you are of it. Then consider the same God that trampled death fights for me. Ultimately, we need to proclaim this together because at the peak of all of this, this is what the emphasis is. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and each one of you is wrestling with a mountain of some kind today. Maybe that mountain is old age and you're struggling with the transition of deterioration of your physical body. Maybe that mountain is career-related or family-related, relationally focused. Maybe it's just an unknown of purpose or intention or mission. Maybe it's a mountain of the culture before us. I'll confess that's one that I've struggled with in the last several weeks. And yet in all of these things, do we believe that God is bigger, church? Do we believe that he is more powerful than any force of this world and that he will bring final redemption and justice? Do we believe that, church? I pray we do and I pray we remind ourselves of this and that it motivates us to live it out faithfully day after day after day. So I want you to stand with me, and we're going to proclaim this truth powerfully to remind ourselves and each other that in the face of the mountains, our God is bigger. So I'm going to count to three, and I want you to proclaim this strong and powerfully, church. One, two, three. Father, may we proclaim this in our homes, in our community, in our country, and around the world. God, may we cling to this promise and hope that you are bigger than the mountains we face. And that as we leave this place today, we go not alone, but arm in arm with brothers and sisters in Christ on a firm foundation that's been established by you. Lord, we pray the words of Proverbs 3. Lord, that we would trust you with everything we have. That we wouldn't lean on our own ability or understanding to comprehend what's going on, but that we would acknowledge you, your word, all your ways, and rest in the hope and the promise that you will make straight the paths before us. Father, may you open our eyes to the depth of who you are. Increase our faith, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing this last song together.
us in Christ. Pray that you will help us to wait on you and your timing, Lord. But in the waiting to be active, pursuing your will and your mission that you've called us to as your people. Lord, with one, as one unit, moving towards all that you've called us towards. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming, everyone. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Thank you.